chapter of the Surf Rider Foundation um, here in Wilmington, North Carolina on the traditional land of, uh, we think the Cape Fear Indians who were a Siouan group. And uh, we've got with us tonight, uh, Professor Isaiah Walker, who teaches at BYU Hawaii. Uh, and he uh, has written a couple of really interesting articles and in this book that we're discussing tonight called Waves of Resistance, Surfing and History in 20th Century Hawaii. Uh, and I don't want to take up any more time except for to say that he, for those of you who are just logging on, has said just go ahead and post your questions in the chat as you have them and I will relay them to him during the talk. Thank you so much for being here, Dr. Walker. Go ahead whenever you're ready. All right. Aloha. Aloha mai kako. Uh, so good to be here and to, um, you know, I'm Grateful to Maya and everyone else for for inviting me out to to hang out with you guys and talk story with you guys in Hawaii we call it talk story. Um, you know I'm I'm open to since it's a discussion I'm open to just you know if you want to just throw out a question that that'd be great or um, but I also prepared some slides just just to help us kind of follow along and because um, also there's some slides that I think are important to kind of show um, some imagery in, in this. But a uh, little, I guess a little more about uh, myself. I was born and raised in Hawaii. Um, let me go ahead and share the screen already. I have some. Okay. Where are you? All right, view, there you are. Okay, so uh, a little about myself. I have five kids, uh, kind of a big group and uh, all of them are surfers. I'm really excited because for a while it was just my older two that, you know, I had to make them go, right? Like I had to like, come on, get in the truck. We're going to surf. And oftentimes when they're little, they kind of kick and scream. Um, but those two are like, you know, my surf buddies now. So it's kind of cool. They keep me fit and keep, now they're dragging me out and reminding me that we need to go more often. But my little one here, I'm mostly excited because she finally got the surf bug. And now she, uh, in fact, today, um, you know, she probably doesn't like that I'm here because she gets out of school early today and she wants me to take her surf. So uh, anyway, we're excited about uh, having that opportunity and privilege. Uh, some of my kupuna, in Hawaiian kupuna means your, like your ancestors. Uh, and so my surfing lineage comes through my, um, my Hawaiian side of the family. And so my dad was from, actually my dad was from Ohio and also Kentucky. And he was kind of like a hippie doctor. <laughs> and he, um, it was interesting. He, he had long hair and he had a, you know he had a residency at the University of Chicago and they told him he had to cut his hair. And I guess he was being rebellious or whatever. And he decided not to go there and he found that Hawaii was one of the more liberal states in the U.S. and went to Queens Hospital, in which case he met my mom, who this is my mom's side of the family, uh, my great grandfather, my great grandmother. And uh, they were, you know, they were from uh, Maui originally, but then they lived in, in Oahu. They lived on many parts of the island. And this is the line that goes through. So these are my great great grandparents this is my great grandmother if you ever spend any time in hawaii uh you may have heard of ek fernandez uh they, they're they were known to be kind of like the entertainment group in hawaii they do carnivals and fairs and a bunch of things anyway so that's he was the one boy was edwin kane and then they had five daughters and so this was my great grandmother so this is my great grandmother again this is my mom's mom i grew up with grandma abby so her dad was um, was English, last name Cutter, and this was my grandma's parents. And so my grandma, these, these folks here actually lived on the beach in a place called Kalia Waikiki. Kalia is right next to, uh, today, unfortunately, it's called Fort Derusi. So 
my grandmother, when she was a little girl, she grew up in right there on the beach in Waikiki. And um, the US Army condemned that whole community. Uh, FYI, the Kahanamoku, actually the Paoa family. So do Kahanamoku, uh, his mom's side of the family was known as the Paoa family, the Paoa clan. So they lived in that same neighborhood. My grandmother actually grew up surfing with Duke's younger brothers. Um, and so this is kind of my surfing lineage uh, from my grandma. Unfortunately, four and a half acres of our family's land uh, ended up in the U.S. Army's hands. And today I'll go there once in a while and just cry a little bit. <laughs> uh, anyway, <clears throat> so it's a little bit about my Ohana, my family. And uh, but I grew up in Hilo on the Big Island. So even though my my ohana is from, from originally Maui and then Oahu and Waikiki. Uh, my parents uh, moved to Hilo on the Big Island where my dad uh, was a physician there. And we lived in a very Hawaiian neighborhood. So my dad was really into serving like underprivileged communities and folks that didn't have much like insurance and stuff. And so we ended up not having a lot of money, but we had a lot of love in the community, a lot of uh, free fish and uh, anything that people would give instead of, of money, we, we ended up enjoying. Um, so poinanalu is the Hawaiian term for the, the lineup, essentially. And in Hawaiian, there's a lot of different terms for water and ocean conditions from the moana to the poinanalu to the kai to upstream is the vai. And so there's a bunch of different words uh, for different kinds of water and waves and conditions. Um, and just like today, the Hawaiians had names for each of the surfing breaks. So, uh, you know, a lot of similarity to the way that we associate um, with our, you know, our break and where we call our home break and things like that. Um, I grew up surfing from a young age. Um, my mom actually was the first one, to, you know, start taking me to the beach and when I was very little. And so I've been a real like a lifelong surfer and for me it's funny because my wife my wife uh who's an anthropologist and she's also a pacific islander she's off of Kasi, which is means she's half samoan and half caucasian she um she reminds me like oh this book is like you're unveiling all your personal insecurities in it <laughs> Uh, she's like, whoa, how come you're focusing so much on masculinity? Are you having issues with that, honey? And anyway, um, so I didn't realize it, but this is often true. And, you know, indigenous scholarship, it's very self-reflexive. People end up putting themselves into the story quite a bit. And, and as a Kanaka Maoli, a, a Hawaiian, I, I suppose I did that. I mean, and, and it wasn't just, um, just that, but also there are a lot of things I didn't realize that were part of the articulation of the, of the story that I was writing to, um, for example, this concept of the ocean as a, as a kind of sanctuary, right? Uh, in Hawaiian, the term is pu'uhonua. I think for me, that was, was really true. My parents got divorced when I was really young and it wasn't the greatest kind of separation. And the ocean became a sanctuary for me. And I, and I think for any of you who surf uh, who, or even just enjoy being around the ocean or maybe for you, it's the mountains. There, there is that sense of uh, sanct sanctuary or sanctity that we find in certain places and certain spaces. But for me, the ocean has always been that. So I suppose like that, um, that relationship that I've experienced in my life over to my research and finding that the story was true for many other people, particularly Native Hawaiians who have had this generational trauma experience and how the ocean was never really in the same way that the land was, right? Which is, which is interesting to the concept of space too. So for, for many folks who, who moved to Hawaii from, from the mainland or from landlocked areas, they describe a sensation known as island fever, right? And for me, I have the exact opposite experience. When I'm, when I'm in a continent and I'm landlocked and I can't see the ocean, I get very claustrophobic. I feel like I don't know where I'm, how to situate my brain. Um, 
And in, in old Hawaii, the, the ocean was a part of the space, the ocean, the sky. So the Moana, the Lani, the mountains, it, it was all kind of a continuum of space. It wasn't necessarily, you know, land as the, um, as the only part of that village or in Hawaiian, we call it an ahupua'a, your community. And in Ahupua'a, and it stretches out to the ocean. So you'd have a village and it would have boundaries in that village, but that would stretch out. It didn't end at the shoreline. And for, for us today, and, uh, and even in Hawaii, pretty much a, 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 a space like a, a land division ends at the shoreline. Uh, for example, if you have a house on the North Shore and the ocean is coming up into your yard, guess what? That's no longer like your space. The, the beach is public and it's part of like a, an unowned space, right? Um, but in traditional times, and we see this even like, for example, in Fiji, there is a lot of controversy over this because, uh, you know, those guys at Taburua were leasing the tenure of the village that they owned the reef of. Okay, this is a very traditional concept in Polynesia and most of the Pacific was a village extended out into the ocean where the reefs were. Um, and so, I mean, we haven't really seen, you know, that was kind of an interesting way of monopolizing and monetizing a space of, of traditional space on the reef, which I think a lot of the villagers didn't really understand. They're like, well, are you gonna take all our fish? They're like, no, oh, okay. Um, most of it was, of course, for managing resources like fish. So in this story of Hawaii, uh, the ocean not being colonized uh, in that same way allowed for this, this autonomy to remain sort of adjacent to the heavy colonialism that was taking place right on shore. And we still see the difference today. The, the, the social dynamics, the, the power dynamics in Hawaii train, change drastically when you, when you cross the beach into the water. I, I took a group of my students to, uh, to Waikiki Beach to do some kind of participant observation and to, to watch um, social dynamics. And there was one of my students and she said, you know, I was sitting there on the beach and I watched this guy when we were in actually we were in the water we saw, I saw this guy and he was clearly like you know he was the guy that was catching most of the waves everyone was saying hi to him they called him uncle hey uncle how's it going um and he was like seemed like to be the chief out there she said she watched as he put his surfboard in the surf rack crossed the street and checked into his job at the hotel where he was like the bell hop or something and she said she instantly saw his role switch, that he went from the uncle that was like the chief out in the water to somebody in a subservient role being bossed around by someone telling him to take his bags upstairs. So you still see that dynamic. And I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it is cool that the ocean has that, that space, that opportunity for, for people especially here in Hawaii to experience at least a glimpse of what autonomy is. And I think the surfing world has really recognized that. Um, I'll be honest, I'm having a lot of issues right now with the Olympics in, in surfing. And it has to do with the fact that um, Hawaii has always demanded autonomy in the surf world. And they've been recognized for it. Right, so even John John Florence today, if you're watching the surf contest in Australia, he wears a Hawaiian flag. That's about to shift. It's changing already, right? Um, likewise with Carissa. I'm actually good friends with Carissa Moore, and uh, we worked together recently on a project. She was, I don't know if she wants me divulging this, but um, you know, she was trying to struggle with. She was struggling with like. What's, what's the motivation? What it's, it was kind of challenging for her to, um, to switch nationalities, right? To go from being Hawaiian to now being American in the surf contest. And it was, you know, it was kind of a identity issue for her. And, um, you know, she, her and her, her dad and, and a friend of mine, uh, an artist, uh, sat together and thought, well, what, you know, what are some things that we 
could do. And they're limited in, in like with her surfboards and stuff to like, she was hoping like, well, how could I represent Hawaii sometime somehow uh, visibly, you know, on my board. And, you know, they're pretty strict about what you can put on your surfboard in the Olympics. But we found some wiggle room and went with, there's, um, I was actually giving a lecture in the Iolani Palace and her dad was there and we were talking afterwards. And Hawaiians of old were um, much more aligned with the British, in fact. It was kind of a surprise that America would colonize Hawaii because the British were, you know, were much more aligned with the whole monarchy thing. Um, King Kamehameha I had uh, established Hawaii as the protectorate of the British and the British did recognize Hawaii's independence uh, as a, and an independent state, which is very important um, to the story because Hawaii was the first non-European uh, state that was recognized as independent to uh, in this larger you know global world. Um, so um, so anyway, we're in the Iolani Palace, and the Hawaiians have um, these coat of arms, very British kind of thing. You you may have seen it before, but um, Carissa designed her own personal version of a Hawaiian coat of arms. And if you look at it, there's Duke Hanamoku is one of the images in there, and so is Rel Sun. Um, and there's all this other imagery around it. Um, anyway, so it's it's kind of cool, but you can see how uh, for for Hawaii, identifying with culture and the ocean and surfing is uh, is you know it means a lot. It's more than just you know like I'm from this state or you know I'm a I'm from Surf City, USA. These are all important things, but because it's wrapped up in this history of colonialism and also the success of, of surfers in preserving that space from colonial conquest, there's a lot of emotional attachment to it as a space. Um, and because of that, Hawaiians are able to redefine themselves in the ocean uh, in, in ways that are different from how they're expected to behave um, on land. So I'm talking a lot, maybe with, you know, we have some questions at this point because I've covered a lot of things. I have a, I have a brief question. Uh, the, um, you know, one of the uh, things that we're dealing with, uh, certainly on the East Coast, and I would imagine in other places on the US mainland um, is, the for one thing the dynamics of appropriation and having sort of taken this which i think you're about to describe the history of sort of taken this practice and redefined it mostly as this white male thing um and then that fed into the dynamics uh, of localism and exclusion and you know who has access to the beach um, and if you could just, in, any sort of advice or inspiration that you have based on your experience about how we might handle this here while you're talking about this parallel story about what happened there, I would be so appreciative of that because it's it feels like a <laughs> constant wrestling match in our, in our heads. Yeah, um, I don't think, I don't know if I have the answer for you, but I, but I do know that I've, I've seen that. I was surprised. Uh, I don't know why white guys are so upset in the in the ocean these days uh, on the mainland, but Hawaii is a whole different experience. And in fact, you know, I was glad I grew up in Hawaii, even though I'm, you know, I'm part Hawaiian. I'm I'm fair skinned, you know. Um, and so, when you grow up in Hawaii surfing and you're you're white, you're a minority, and um, not just you know, by your presence and your skin tone, but but also by your your place in the lineup, right? So I don't know. So it's unusual for me to see that dynamic, uh, and I have seen it. So I've I've been a surf coach for high school surfing for for many years, uh, and I I just used to coach for Kamehameha Schools, which is an all Hawaiian school. Like you have to be of Native Hawaiian ancestry to attend there. Um, we won nationals twice, the NSSA at um, uh, Salt Creek. But when we'd go down there, it was a trip to see, uh, you know, I, I once was surfing in San Onofre and I, and there was like a 
Chinese couple, old folks fishing on the beach. And I saw this older American gentleman just start yelling at them because they were fishing near him. And I was just kind of like, oh, how's this guy? Uh, in Hawaii, that guy who got slaps. <laughs> um, so, I mean, respect is a big deal in Hawaiian culture and in the ocean. Um, you know, I, and it, it is disconcerting to me because my, my sense of what surfing means is very different from, I think, what the majority of the surfers out there think. Um, like I'm always appalled when I'm, when I'm watching surf contests today and you'll see the threads and comments are just very racist, very sexist, um, like this kind of animosity toward Brazilian surfers just baffles me. Um, and even towards women, I think um, uh, Tyler Wright, for example, I don't know how many of you follow professional surfing, but Tyler Wright, all she did was write on her board like Black Lives Matter. And there's this, anytime she surfs now, there's this whole thread of comments, just like very racist stuff. Like, oh, tell her to take her activism home and surfing doesn't belong, politics and surfing shouldn't mix. And, and I'm just like, wow, this is like a problem. And I think there's like a you know crisis that of course, some of these people are going through, I guess, of just feeling threatened and, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, that's really disconcerting. And, and again, in, in Hawaii, the dynamic is so different. Um, and I've seen many, you know, people like that get put in their place in Hawaii very quickly. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's unfortunate. I mean, I like to think that, um, you know, that, that people focusing on, on the roots of surfing as being an indigenous sport may be helpful to this story, right? Because a sense of ownership, it's, a, it's not authentic, right? It, it's, it's not an authentic story if you think that you're from California and you have some sort of entitlement to surfing as, your, as something that you started and that you own, whereas that's you know, it's incorrect, first of all, but it's also narrow-minded. Um, so, and so I can explain this, this actually comes up in this next part, is important to this story. So there has been a narrative that has created this myth of surfing becoming like a California and a Australia male, uh, primarily white audio, um, um, ownership. And that really, the, the narrative comes from a lot of surf history books and films that really started with, I, I would say like even with Ben Finney wrote one of the early surf history books and he talked about how surfing was the sport of kings and then how it went from this Hawaiian sport of kings that, and then Duke Hanamoku becomes this ambassador of aloha that gifts surfing to the rest of the world. To me that there's a huge problem in that whole part of the narrative. Right, um, Duke Hanamoku uh, is used as this as this uh, beacon to sh to hand off uh, surfing to to America and the in Australia, and then almost like the native Hawaiian disappears after that, right? And a lot of these narratives, like oh, and then all of a sudden the story turns into Greg Knoll and California and how it grew up there. And I'm not trying to say that. You know, Greg Knoll wasn't significant in the history of surfing, but I find it incredibly problematic when the when the surf narrative then goes from California surfing and how it picked up there, and then all of a sudden he comes back, like Greg Knoll and his crew come back to Hawaii in the 1950s and they discover it. Like that just doesn't make sense, right? Like if it came from Hawaii and then all of a sudden California is now coming and discovering surfing in Hawaii. And of course, it's like, well, the North Shore and Makaha, and um, as if there weren't Hawaiian surfing anymore. So, so kind of a central concern to that narrative is the idea that the Hawaiian dies out from surfing. And I hear it over and over and over. And to any of you who are writing surf history or telling this story, please stop. Hawaiian surfing never died, right? And that's very important, I think, because Oftentimes that is the, the, the tool for justifying that Hawaii 
was a sport, the surfing was the sport of kings for ancient Hawaiians. And this regal sport made its way into a new regal place. And now they are the inheritors of this sport that no longer is associated with them. Very untrue. Um, here, here's a slide I went through, you know, just some examples, because mostly they say it dies out in the 1800s, right? That the missionaries destroyed the sport. Uh, that's another thing that I think we should stop saying. The missionaries, many of the missionaries didn't like the fact that kids weren't going to school, uh, but not all of them hated surfing. And I'm not trying to defend missionaries, uh, but it, it's too simplistic of a story to just say that. And it did just die out. In fact, if you look at the newspapers and you have missionary run newspapers that are written in Hawaiian, They'll talk about, they'll complain about, oh man, these kids, they're, they're not you know, coming to school as much as they should and they're surfing too much and how dare they, right? If somebody's complaining about surfing, uh, that means they're still <laughs> surfing, right? So here's just some, some highlights in the 1820s, 1830s, 1840s, all the way, I picked every decade to show examples of, many examples of people still surfing in this time period. Um, on not and on on the outer islands as well, not just in Waikiki, because the story of Duke Hanamoku, what's important to that myth making is that Duke was the kind of the last one. Waikiki was the last place where anyone was surfing, and then it that little dying thread of of light makes its way over somewhere else. And then, but it you know Waikiki was not the only place to surf. In fact, I would say that Duke wasn't my father, and when it comes to the the lineage of surfing. I learned to surf in Hilo, and Hilo has its own line of Duke Hanamokus that have not been highlighted, that I'll show you some pictures of in a moment. But anyway, so a lot of surfing going on in some of the outer islands. Now, it is true that fewer people were surfing during this time because Hawaiians were dying uh, in very large numbers. And so, the, but, but here's the thing, even though the Hawaiian population was devastated by a real pandemic that literally killed 90% of the population. The ocean was still a kind of sanctuary and a pu'uhonua for those who were struggling. So during the death, people were still making their way into the water for the same kind of reasons that they're doing it when life is hard during the overthrow of the government later, or when today when life is hard and you feel like you just need to get out. So people were still surfing. And there's many like very famous uh, writings about it. Like, I mean, Samuel Clemens or Mark Twain's writes in, you know, his own literature about how he went to surf and saw people surfing and tried it and failed miserably at it. Um, in the 1870s, there were, there were surfing competitions in Waikiki, uh, other surf exhibits in the 1880s and the 1890s. Uh, where I'm from, Hilo, it was a real kind of epicenter for surfing in the 1870s to 1900s during a time when people have often stated that surfing was was dying. A um, lot of examples uh, and uh, Pat Moser uh, did a, wrote a really good article a few years ago on kind of you know supporting these this, this idea too that surfing was um, was still alive and you know, there's a lot of, that's a good article if you're, you're curious about um, a lot of examples. Let's put some examples of quotes of people, travelers that came who mentioned and described surfing in detail. Uh, these are some shots of, of Hilo where I grew up. Um, and again, I mean, I'm not going to read this whole quote, but just, just to show that there were so many examples that we have of people witnessing surfing, be amazed by the surfers and describing people riding on the waves and we're just, um, you know, enamored by it. So some of you may be familiar with this photo. This is known as one of the oldest photos of uh, surfers ever taken. Uh, and it was in probably 1890s. And a book that I, in, in Waves of Resistance, the book that I wrote, um, I, I actually am disagreeing with the, the archivist at, at Bishop Museum, the Bishop Museum archivist, uh, DeSoto Brown tried to say that this was Waikiki, but I knew that, um, you know, that, that surfers were surfing other places than just Waikiki in this time. 
And I also grew up surfing this wave. Um, I, and I recognized how it's breaking and it looks nothing like Waikiki, uh, the wave itself. So uh, I, I, I stuck my neck out there and said, no, nah, this, uh, this has got to be Bayfront and Hilo. Um, and then this photo came out more recently and just made my day. So these are the same guys, the same role of film, but this one doesn't have any landmarks in it. And then this photo taken shortly after has the landmark of the Hamakua coast, which is right here. And just to show you, um, so these ones were recently found and just everything about this just um, confirmed. So I, I went, I flew to Hilo with my sons and we took a picture. <laughs> I don't know if you can see this, but um, so there's the same beach. You can see the background of the Hamakua coast, the same. And so, I don't know, I was kind of happy about that. And, and mainly the point is, of course, that um, uh, surfing was not just an isolated thing in one place, but it was something that was practiced throughout the islands, even when people are trying to say that it was an extinct pastime, right? So, all right, maybe, um, uh, maybe I'll, I'll look at the chat. I see some, maybe there's some questions here. Yeah, I'll read them out loud just uh, for accessibility. Um, didn't Duke win his gold medals competing for the U.S.? Do you think he may have felt as Carissa does? Oh, wow. Um, that's a great question, uh, Derek. I, I'm actually right. I, I've been a part of a, a group of us in Hawaii have been trying to, trying to do some things to uh, we, we actually submit an application to the International Olympic Committee trying to get Hawaii recognized as a as its own entity. It hasn't gone too easily. It's a it's a it's a tall order. Um, but um, Duke uh, Fleming for the United States, which is interesting because Hawaii was Duke was born in the kingdom of Hawaii. So he was three years old when the queen was overthrown. He was like nine years old when it became, or 10 years old when Hawaii became a territory. So technically Hawaii, when in 1912 and throughout the 1920s when he swam in the Olympics and stuff, um, he, Hawaii was a territory, which the IOC has recognized uh, territories as separate from their main place, you know, Puerto Rico, American Samoa, some of these territories have um, gotten recognized separate uh, nations in the Olympic. So I have some some friends right now, they're like, brah, he wasn't even swimming for the US, he was territory of Hawaii. But um, yeah, technically he was uh, swimming for the United States. And I think um, Duke became very popular and famous worldwide when he was winning these Olympic medals. But um, interestingly, especially in the 1912 Olympics, he was dominant in the water and Jim Thorpe, a Native American, was dominant on land. Those two became friends. And so it was kind of very interesting that both America's top like water and land athletes were Native peoples and um, were very dominant. In fact, Duke became very nervous because he watched how eventually the United States treated Jim Thorpe pretty poorly. And, the, the, you know, they stripped him of a lot of his medals claiming that he was making money playing baseball and that disqualified him from all of his accolades. <clears throat> and that made Duke really nervous because he was good friends with Jim Thorpe. And um, so, I, you know, I, I think Duke and his relationship with, uh, with the Olympics and the being swimming for the United States, I think, I don't know exactly how he felt, but I know that he always referred, he was referred to even in the papers as the Hawaiian. I mean, he was clearly very dark as a Hawaiian um, and when he traveled, he, you know, he would bring an ukulele, he would surf, he'd have these surfing exhibitions, all these different stop offs where he, he would travel to. So even though he was, I think, you know, winning gold medals for the United States, he was still identified as Hawaiian. Um, and I think you're right about the Carissa thing and the Duke um, having similar kinds of feelings that that might be hard. I think in many ways it was much harder for Duke because Duke had lived through that transition, that occupation. He watched his family 
along with my family, get physically removed from their childhood home by the US military. Uh, and he ended up homeless. Well, luckily he had a really rich friend named Doris Duke and she helped him buy a fancy house up on Portlock Point. But otherwise they lost the Pa'oa family land. So, uh, you know, imagine having to represent that. Uh, my guess is that he was probably very conflicted and we've, you know, these are my personal feelings, but I think we've really, well, it's also backed up by a lot of historic history too, but we, we've, Duke was really used uh, by the tourism industry to, to market Hawaii in ways that <clears throat> I think I'm, I'm still kind of a little uncomfortable with, and I'm, I'm sure maybe he wasn't always so happy with that um, you know, he was kind of seen as the ambassador of Aloha that was the like the host of Waikiki, like, please come and come and have Hawaii, come and visit us. And uh, and as the mascot for tourism, I, I don't think that was his his real true kind of feeling about his identification with Hawaii that wasn't just like. The prostitute to be sold, you know. Um, uh, what was the most important lesson you've learned while surfing? <laughs> uh, to I don't know. To be respectful. To um, enjoy enjoy the connection you can have, spiritual connection while you're out there in the ocean. Uh, what can you? What can we do to detoxify and deconstruct these derogatory narratives? Thank you. I think any chance you have of like helping to change the narrative, I'm really grateful that it. I have seen it changing more, right? So, uh, you guys had Scott Latterman on a couple uh, couple lectures ago, um, and you know several other surfing academics now are realizing that like. Oh wow, there's some problems with the the surf history movie narrative that kind of has told kind of the strong. In fact, when um, when I this narrative was um, riding giants. There's a section in the movie, and this movie went pretty big in mainstream theaters and it perpetuated the story of like they said the Polynesian pastime went extinct and then Alexander Hume Ford revived it and then it became something that was now American. <clears throat> uh, in, in one of the chapters I, I pick on that particular film and it was done by Sam George. Uh, to Sam George credit, he called me one day in my office and it was a bizarre thing because Nia People's name came up on the caller ID and if I don't, I don't know if you know who Nia people's is but when every one of my friends was in love with her because she was the main character in uh, North Shore the movie Kiana anyway but um, I was anyway it was a very bizarre experience in my office and Nia people's name comes up on my caller ID and I'm like hello uh, I was like hey this is Sam George apparently Sam George married Nia people's and you know they're anyway so so I'm like, hey, he's like hey this is Sam George I read your book and I was like what do you think? Uh, you know, there's a moment of kind of silence. And then he was like, I really liked it. And to be honest, I was kind of just following with what all the kind of other books have sort of said. And, uh, and it's a trip. This is a history lesson too. Oftentimes people will find one, one kind of uh, primary source and, they, and they'll, they'll be misread it or they'll use it wrongly. And then once one book publishes it, you get a bunch of lazy historians who instead of going to the original sources and actually trying to learn about, they'll just kind of say what the other person said. So I honestly feel like that's what has happened. And it, it's a good story, right? It makes this story of how it becomes a California sport and it makes sense and the narrative flows, but it's just not accurate. Um, so the more chance we have of being better scholars, better historians, taking the time to actually look at the primary sources and analyze the, the real story and try not to perpetuate myths just because somebody else started it. Um, I, I've got another question that I want to insert, especially because we're looking at this, this one beautiful picture of um, these powerful Hawaiian for so long. One of the beautiful things about your book that I don't know that I've seen anywhere else is the way it talks about the role of women 
in the surf zone and in mythology that was used to pass the culture, pass down the culture from generation to generation. Could you talk a little bit about that for people who haven't read the book? Uh, yes. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see that surfing is becoming uh, m much truer to its orig original roots, which is there's there's if you if you read most of the Hawaiian uh, mo'olelo, mo'olelo is another word for like our our histories or our legends. Um, most of them are about women as surfers. Okay, so I mean, from Kelea to Laie Kavai to many many others, there's these stories of of women as surfers, very powerful ones too. Um, I mean, women in Hawaiian culture and history have a lot of mana to them. Like, for example, you may have heard of the fire goddess Pele. Um, she's known as just being very um, strong. And, and Hawaiian women, <clears throat> gender roles were very different. Now, it's not to say that, you know, there were no gender roles in old, old Hawaii. I mean, there were, but they were different, right? There were different kinds of gender boundaries than there are today. And, and that really, I mean, the unfortunate thing is when Western gender boundary, boundaries become imposed on Hawaiian women in the 1900s, and um, the person that dealt with that uh, most directly I'm gonna, is this woman right here, Princess Victoria Kaiulani. So Kaiulani is, um, you know, she's the next heir to the throne after Lili'u Okalani. Uh, Lili'u is the last queen of Hawaii. She's the one who's overthrown in 1893, but this is her niece. So in other words, the queen's sister's daughter who is half um, Scottish. So her dad, uh, Cleghorn was a Scottish uh, man anyway. So, but she was, um, you know, she was Hawaiian royalty and she was a surfer. She, she had this estate. In fact, both of these, these two are cousins here. The other one in the picture is uh, Jonah Kuhio. You go to Waikiki Beach, the real, the, the local people will call the beach Kuhio Beach, because that's where Prince Kuhio had a home, but so did she. Victoria Kaiulani had a house called Ainahau Gardens right there in Waikiki, and she loved to surf. Uh, there's rumors that she may have surfed in, in, in England when she was in school over there. Uh, her cousin here, who was also went off to school, a lot of Hawaiians are very, especially the Royal Hawaiians were very well educated. They went overseas, went to schools in, in London. And uh, this guy, Prince Kuhio, went to school in the 1850s, or 1885, excuse me, um, in 86 in, uh, in San Mateo County in California, right? And while he's in school up there, he's the first one to surf in California from Hawaii. And he puts on this exhibition and there's stories of in the newspaper in Santa Cruz. And this is where Santa Cruz uh, likes to claim him as their first surfer. Um, but to Kaiulani, unfortunately, she, uh, she kind of lived in this time when when women's roles of Western women's roles were being forced upon her, but you know, good for her. She she refused and resisted a lot of these. For example, you know, she was discouraged from surfing um, from her dad's side of the family and from you know Westerners and Americans who who knew her, but she didn't listen. Right? She surfed regardless of their suggestions that it was unladylike. Um, so trying to balance new gender roles was, um, was a struggle for Hawaiian women because surfing in its roots and its origins was very much so a, a, a female and male, but it was very, I mean, the, the ocean was a space where women surfed and and many of those talk about women being much more graceful and successful in the waves. Um, so Kaiulani was a surfer for sure. Um, and you also, I mean, this is where I think it's, it's fitting and appropriate that even today you have a lot of Hawaiian female surfers who've sort of led the charge in bringing surfing back, not only Carissa Moore, but Malia Manuel, Coco Ho, and of course, a lot of them draw inspiration, we were talking earlier, uh, about Rail Sun. Um, she's uh, from Mokaha and she was one of the women who, who started professional surfing for women. She broke a lot of these 
boundaries. She was one of the first female um, lifeguards. She um, was very highly respected in, in Hawaii and also became, you know, kind of an advocate for women in, in the surf. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, I mean, when I wrote the book, I, I, I got my PhD at UC Santa Barbara and uh, most of my, you know, the, the, a lot of the kind of methodology of the book was looking toward like kind of masculinity and studying um, identity and masculinity in Hawaii. But, you know, it's, it, you, can't, um, you can't not talk about women and surfing in Hawaii uh, because they have been integral to the experience. I mean, which, which may be, you know, something, uh, you know, you talked earlier about how do you change some of these, these prejudices and, uh, and mindsets in other places in, in these, the States or in the continent or elsewhere. <clears throat> Again, maybe reminding folks that, you know, did you know that surfing in its origin was dominated by uh, women? Um, so anyway, and I don't know, take your daughter surfing and, um, help to kind of re <laughs> repopulate the lineup. Great, how about this? Uh, tourism is often called new colonialism. Do you have any thoughts on modern surf, surf tourism, i.e. white people visiting non-white countries to surf? Uh, um, you know, the, there's a lot of uh, uh, surfing academics uh, that have focused on this. In fact, I met Maya at a conference where it was, this was kind of the main question, like what is surf tourism? How, is there such thing as responsible surf tourism? Um, as you can imagine, just the story I told uh, about my family in Waikiki, I am not completely sold on, on the whole industry. Um, and I mean, hopefully, you know, hopefully there's, there's, you know, there's benevolent ways of people being able to, uh, explore the world and and surfing um however it is you know it is kind of troubling right when you go to certain places like the first time i i went to to surf in uh, i went and surfed in tavarua uh before they changed that whole thing whereas where now you can you can surf there but before they since tavarua island owned exclusive rights to leasing that space of reef uh they would literally kick people out and uh um, I thought that was, you know, a very bizarre uh, experience when I was there because you had, you know, some Fijians, the, the local people that would hire, they were working in like their restaurant and boating people out. And, and then you had, you know, primary, primarily upper class, um, mostly, you know, American guests who'd come out and surf the place and a real bizarre sort of feel to it. Um, and, and then, I mean, they didn't even let local Fijians <laughs> come out and surf except for a certain day of the week. And then if they worked at the hotel and if they were a boatman, you could, you know, maybe catch a couple of waves while you're watching the guests, right? So they're, you know, they, those kind of things uh, are, are pretty bizarre and, and colonial for sure. I mean, you definitely have that with this whole kind of movement for like, it's, it, was, it was kind of a new colonialism of, of like the, you know the 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 boats that go out and find the new places and um you know then establish camps there um so yeah i'm not a huge fan but i you know at the same time i'm you know i i do hope that people will be able to experience surfing different waves and um find a way to do it reasonably and in a way that's respectfully i think that's what it boils down is just being respectful and not just imposing yourself. And, and a lot of that has to do with maybe just respecting that you are you know, a second class citizen maybe in a lineup, which might be hard for some people. Like I paid for this, I should be catching all the good waves. It's like, well, <laughs> maybe not. Um, and so anyway, uh, what documentaries do you recommend surf culture so uh back to my story about nia peoples calling me uh, in my office on my cell phone and it was actually uh um uh, what's his name again sam, help me out here sam george sam george thank you uh sam said look i i want I'm, I'm making a new film and i would really like to have your help on it 
And so in, the result was a ESPN 30 for 30 film called uh, Hawaiian, The Legend of Eddie Aikau. I think he did a pretty good job in that one, right? I, I, I do like the film and um, so, and it's a good, you know, ESPN 30 for 30, really well done. Uh, I would recommend that one. And there's probably others, you know, um, but maybe start there. Great. <laughs> All right, so there's another question. Can I talk about the hui? Um, sure. I'm fast forwarding here. Um, Oh, skipping through quite a few slides. So somebody asked about the Hui. Uh, this project started, uh, my book actually started, the first thing I wrote up in this in this book was about the surf club, the Hui. Um, it's, the, the real name is a Hui Ohe'e Nalu. And don't get that confused with the Hui Nalu. So there's two different clubs that are very, you know, they have some similarities, but they're different time periods. So the uh, Dukanamoku, started what was called the Hui Nalu Club. And that was, uh, it was originally started because the outrigger and the, the other white swim clubs wouldn't let him swim for them, right? So, and, and in order to qualify for the Olympics, you needed to be represented by a swim club. So they started their own swim club called the Hui Nalu Club, which became their surf club. And he qualified through the Olympics through that. Now, of course, after he won his gold medals, all those other clubs wanted to kind of bank off his notoriety. So even though many of those clubs like the Outrigger were, were literally racially segregated, like you had to be white. Um, they made an exception for Duke, but anyway, uh, he, he, he doesn't join them right away. Eventually he gets later in life, he marries um, uh, a, a lady from that's part of the club and he kind of joins. And there's a lot of Hawaiians that aren't happy with him doing that, by the way. They're like, oh, he sold out. Um, but where were I? But this club, 1976, uh, this project started, I was a student, actually at the school that I now teach at, I attended here as an undergrad and I studied history and um, under Paul Spickard, who's now uh, in the UC system, but uh, he was a great mentor. And when I had to write a senior paper for, for my undergrad in history, and there was a, there are quite a few people on our campus that I found out were founders of this surf club. And as a kid growing up in Hilo uh, and having watching the movie North Shore, I had some friends who were Hawaiians that would that came up here that joined that were part of the Hui and they came back home. And there was like this kind of aura about like, oh, who's these guys? Like, oh, don't mess with them. And um, but when I started talking to some of these guys, I found it's just way different version of the story. And I was intrigued because a lot of them were um, were Mormons, <laughs> uh, which was kind of bizarre to me because I was like, well, I mean, the, I mean, not a lot of them were still very kind of active in the church, but a lot of them grew up in very kind of family, you know, very kind of clean living, not the kind of radical backgrounds that you would think of. Uh, I mean, maybe also because on the North Shore, the areas of the North Shore that are predominantly like Hawaiian, like native Hawaiians are more so around the corner, like Kahuku, Laie, Haula, and these were where these guys lived. And those also happen to be places where the Mormon church is pretty prevalent. But, so I, but I was intrigued, right? Because it didn't line up with my, my sense of who these people were. So I just started interviewing a bunch of them and trying to get their version of the story. And I had realized that their story had been told so much by other people and also represented by individuals like the Rothman family. Um, whereas there were so many others that were a part of the story that their voice I felt like just wasn't heard. And I was hearing these, these, these different perspectives and these stories that were shared with me. And I thought like, wow, here's a perfect example of a history that's just been not told and then misrepresented in, in newspapers in Hawaii. They were called terrorists and thugs. And um, but as I started to kind of dive deeper into it, I realized it was very grounded in this sense of a Hawaiian movement. Um, everything like you, this image here, uh, everything from the logo that they picked out to 
the name that they call themselves, a lot of thought went into it, like to represent their identity as Hawaiians. Uh, even the colors they on the shorts, if you're familiar, they have um, these shorts. Let's see, I can, that, um, so you can kind of see it here. Junior Moipono is wearing them here. There's a yellow and a red stripe on the side of the shorts. And that is the colors of traditional uh, chiefly colors in old Hawaii. Uh, there were these birds that had red and yellow feathers. And if you had that red and feather cape that distinguished you as like a Hawaiian, it was Hawaiian bling basically, right? It was like, if you got a feather cape or a feather hat, you were like cool uh, and important. Um, so, so anyway, yeah, so um, I, as I kind of researched more, I, I realized there was a lot more to the story than told. And a lot of it had to do with them really kind of taking a stand for their space. Now, I don't want to, you know, try and make the claim that, well, all these guys were angels. They were all good people. They're, they were completely wronged and none of them did anything bad. I mean, there were some, you know, some tough guys. And then unfortunately there, you know, there, uh, there was like on the North Shore some you know, I don't want to get, get too much into like, but like cocaine in the 70s and 80s, uh, there was some of it coming in, right? But I think, you know, as this is like a, it's also like, you know, a, an industry, an illegal one that was benefiting certain individuals. Um, and Hawaiians saw their community as being exploited. Uh, in, in surf industry and in some of the underground industry and particularly in the waves and in the surf. Uh, when the thing that really frustrated them most was when uh, the city and county would issue permits for these surfing events to have exclusive use to the ocean. I mean, they still do this today, right? When you have a surfing competition, they have permits that like, okay, only us can surf here. But when in the 1976 and through the early, uh, the late stages of the 70s, these permits were handed out like candy and they would have very long windows and they would exclude the local surfers and kids for a long time. And not just that, but a lot of these early events were invitation only events that even though a lot of the Hawaiians were surfing as well, if not better than some of the competitors, they still weren't allowed in. So the Duke Invitational, for example, is a, is a prime example where Eddie Aikau and Ben Aipo wanted to surf in it and they weren't allowed to. Uh, they paddling out anyway alongside of that. Who was an old man at that time. He went, he wasn't in kind of just like for names to use him to kind of promote the event. But he, he, he would come to hand out like trophies and stuff. And he was like, hey, what's up with the Hawaiians? How come you're not letting them in? And then the next year they did get in and both of them made it to the finals and did really well. Um, so it, it was that sense of, which goes back to what I was talking about earlier about this myth of like, the Hawaiian didn't make sense, you know, like to, to that narrative, right? Because Duke was the last Hawaiian, even in that event, right? Is classic, like Duke, handing over trophies to Californian surfers. It's this kind of the, you can see how that narrative plays out. And so if you see like Eddie Aikawa, a dark Hawaiian who surfs really good and you're like, who's this guy? And in your mind, it just doesn't make sense. Like, oh no, you know, this isn't a Hawaiian sport anymore. Who are, you know, these guys are, who are they? You know, they can't be a part of this because then it, it fractures our sense of who we are. That's exactly why there was a lot of tension. Uh, I mean, everybody's heard the story of, of uh, Rabbit Bartholomew. He's told that story many, many times of how he got beat up at Sunset Beach. Interestingly, uh, I talked to a guy that confessed to me. He's like, I was the one who punched him. I don't know why he keeps telling everybody he was jumped by a mob of guys. It was just me. <laughs> anyway, um, so where was I? Oh uh, yeah, so so when you have these conflicting identities that are, you know, then you have these competitions coming in North Shore, and then you have people who are like, oh wait, these events are just for us. Who are you guys? And then the Hawaiians are like, you know, frick you, brother. You cannot just come over here and take over our space. Like, we still 
this is still our space. And you can see where Hawaiians are hyper protective because it's one of the last things that they have. It's like, like the guy I said that worked at the hotel on land, he's not as important as he is in the ocean. And the ocean is also the one space that still is a, a, a conduit to their ancestral past and surfing as a thread to that past that's never been broken. You can see how possessive they've become. So really that tension uh, on, in Hawaii, it really stems from a lot of misunderstanding of the importance of what surfing, it's also a battle for who owns surfing, right? Which is the core problem today that you're talking about on your beaches is the sense of privilege and ownership and who owns it. And in Hawaii that came to a big explosion um, when the hui was formed and it was their way of saying, uh-uh, this is not gonna happen here. And, and then they ended, I mean, they ended up compromising. I think a lot of people realize as well, the Hui wasn't just kind of like thugs that had no sense of, of compromise. They ended up, their compromise was, all right, you can have your events here, um, but you hire us. Even today, if you accomplish on the North Shore, you see the Hawaiian Water Patrol, they get all the, the, the contract to, to be out there and it's all Hui guys, um, the security guards, the beach marshals, uh, the folks that are there on the beach is the point was the Hui was like, you cannot just take, take, and then not, not include us. So it's kind of weird out there, not weird, but you, you see the compromise, how they've um, become kind of included into the, into the whole competition thing. And then it was like, and then let us surf in them too. And then you see from that, I mean, the triple crown after that, it was dominated by, you know, Michael Ho, Derek Ho, Sonny Garcia, Andy Irons. You had a bunch of like local surfers who ended up like really excelling in, in the surf. So, all right, talking a lot. Let's hear some more questions or some conversations from you. I know we only have like 10 more minutes left. I would love it if you would tell, uh... Let me just say, just as a little bit of background for anybody who hasn't read the book, there's um, this wonderful, awful cautionary tale about your interaction with a New York Times reporter. Uh, and I, I hope that you'll tell that story and, and, and maybe weave in something about um, Fred Hemings and what was going on politically with him in the 80s, because all of this feels so eerily relevant to conference that we're having now about violence and communities of color. Oh, yeah. Uh, um, maybe we'll start with uh, the Fred Hemming. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I don't want to talk bad about Fred Hemming because he, I mean, he is a part of the, of our history of our sport. He, but he, he becomes a politician uh, in Hawaii and he's a, Pretty conservative public politician in Hawaii. You know, it's pretty rare to be a Republican and to be elected in office, but he succeeded at that. Um, and then it seemed, in my research, because Fred Hemings was coming out so strong against these Hawaiians, and I mean, okay, so, some context here. If you're not aware, Fred Hemings, um, he also started professional surfing, the IPS, which today is now the Triple Crown. But before the IPS was like the ASP, which was today called the WSO, or um, Fred Hemings and um, Randy Rarick together started professional surfing, this world tour and crowning a world champion kind of thing. So, and that was exactly what the Hui was protesting, right? So they didn't like Fred getting all these permits and having tons of contests on the North Shore that the, they weren't being included as the, you know, being employed with lifeguarding and all these kind of things. So really the Hawaiians um, were in many ways at odds with Fred Hemings, who's a, you know, a pretty wealthy, comes from a pretty wealthy Holly family from Kailua. Um, and I mean, they ended up compromising with Fred, but it is interesting how later when he's he's running for office, he kind of uses the story of the Hui and um, it, there's a lot of reference that he makes to them as being thugs as also which which lined up with his, his whole kind of campaign of like cracking down on crime. And so it became 
became kind of a tool to that part of the story, at least, I mean, in my opinion, and looking at the, the timing of these articles that were coming out about the Hui and also his political stances that, um, as far as the, um, the New York Times interview, that was, that was interesting. So the New York Times wanted to run a piece on like the violence on the North Shore. And I, I sat with them and I said, you know, please, I, the one thing you can't do is just decontextualize this because yeah, there's been some violence on the North Shore, but if you don't provide the historical context of what's going on, then it, you know, it just makes it look like the Hawaiians are, are just savages who just for no reason are, are aggressive on the North Shore. I said, you know, it goes both ways. You have to look at the kind of violence that you know colonialism has imposed on families, and uh, and also contextualize the experience. Like, why is there frustration? How does this relate to Hawaii's larger story? Uh, but instead, they they just showed like these video clips of Kala Alexander body slamming people on the beach, and um, I mean, he was upset too, of course. Um, and so unfortunately, we, this is kind of a, a, you know, a theme that's happened many times over in the media, this, you know, making a savage out of, of people and also um, turning victims into aggressors and not contextualizing the experience. Um, yeah. Okay, any other questions? We do have a few more minutes, I think. Yeah, well, I've got a follow up, but if somebody else has a question that you'd like to ask, uh, please go ahead and post it. Um, yeah, but they, um, the, the end of that story, as you tell it in your book, is that in spite of sitting there with them for two hours and saying, you know, please contextualize this, they didn't in the end. And this was not 1975. This was what, 2009? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so. Unfortunately, the, you know, sensationalizing sens stories and are are more entertaining, right? Um, instead of telling the longer story of like contesting the experience, uh, yeah. All right, so I'm sorry, I'm just trying to chat here. I'll read it to you. I'd really love to hear some Hawaiian, perhaps even just reading the poem from the preface of the book. Oh, Kenny. Okay. Um, the poem is actually what we call an oli. Um, you're going to make me perform. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay. Um, all right. So Hawaiian history was preserved through chance, right? And very, we're very fortunate in Hawaii that um, Hawaii was one of the most literate societies in uh, 18th century uh, world in, in the world. Um, so in other words, there were more, the, there were more people who could read in Hawaii percentage wise in the nation than any other na nation in the 1800s. And a lot of that had to do with um, the fact that uh, the chiefs when, uh, when they, when, you know, reading and writing became a thing because it wasn't traditionally, Hawaiians didn't have writing system. They had petroglyphs and stuff, but it wasn't like a, a, a written language per se. Uh, the chief saw the mana in the palapala, which is the writing, the paper. So uh, because there's a fear, right? Like when you go from an oral society to a, to a written society, <clears throat> you can lose everything in that one generation. It's, it's like a language too, which, which for Hawaiians, it, it got kind of scary there because if you suppress a language and it, it just takes a generation for it to be lost. So same with um, with history. If if your society has preserved history in you know the hard drive of old people's brains, and they've memorized these as chants, then there's that danger of losing it. Uh, but I say Hawaii was fortunate in that the shift to a literate society happened quick enough to where you had a lot of educated Hawaiians that were really good at reading and writing in newspapers with tons of newspapers. And so they started printing all these stories that the old folks still had with them in volumes of Hawaiian language newspapers. So they're a treasure for us um, in, in all these stories. So this uh, here, 
is actually uh, the opening page. This is um, this is an Oli. I'll, I, I'll do the Oli. I feel kind of weird here, but um, you're supposed to stand up when you do this. <laughs> uh, it goes like this. Kuma <laughs> Aloha e, aloha mau e, aloha mau loa e. Mm. Wonderful. Yeah, so uh, that, I mean, the translation is there in the book. Um, so anyway, go ahead and pick it up if you want to buy it. <laughs> and it's not, it's not like I make a lot of money off of it, but um, just you guys being interested in, in reading it is, uh, is a good thing. So Fantastic. mahalo. Mahalo. We are coming to the end of our time. And I just want to thank you, uh, all of you who are here. Oh, wait a minute. Deborah wants to know if you have a, a favorite place where we should go to buy your book. Uh, you know, uh, not really. Uh, it, it doesn't matter wherever you can get it quickest i guess these days um you can get it uh you can get a you know a kindle version so you can get it quickly or get a hard uh get get a get a you know a book so you can put it on your shelf whatever fantastic well i feel like um we have a lot to think about uh in terms of reframing our individual understanding and working to reframe the larger surf culture understanding of how much gratitude we need to have for this culture that comes from indigenous people of color who are still there riding waves have always still been there riding waves uh, and i think it's it's past time for us to become students of this history and thank you so much for doing what i know is incredibly hard work of uh of telling the story in a way that uh, that is so accessible to us and that the academic world can't help but take you seriously <laughs> so much gratitude to you all for right. that uh, thank you all and mahalo and ahui ho thank you thank you to everyone for coming and making this a success we'll announce our next talk soon